it's a great pleasure to be here and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and especially Marsha Stefanik for everything that you've done to make this trip a, a very interesting and stimulating one. And I want to, so I'll start. Did you know that 15 minutes of stress are enough to change the form of some regions of the brain from the male form to the female form or from the female form to the male form? I didn't know that either, but when I discovered this, it transformed the way I was thinking about sex and brain, and also about sex and gender. And I will be talking about this a lot today, in the afternoon, and tomorrow I have three, uh, two talks about this. And maybe I'll get to this a little later if you want, and if Luan wants. But what I want to do now is zoom out a little bit and talk about the general question of the belief that there is a female brain and a male brain, and just frame it a little bit, and I think the general question we are talking about is, is are men men because they are males and have male brains, and women women because they are females and therefore have a female brain? And I think there are at least three complexities of gender we want to consider when we ask this question. The first is, is that we are trying to explain an ever-changing entity that is gender with a never-changing entity, that is sex. So gender is the social meaning of being a male and being a female, and clearly this has been changed consider considerably throughout history and is also different in different cultures. In contrast, sex is the biological characteristics of males and females, and this has not changed at all throughout this time frame. So the first problem is, is this, that we're trying to explain something that is always changing with something that is never changing. And just to give you an example of this problem, in the, at the end of the 19th century, scientists discovered that the, males of brains were, that the brains of males were on average larger than the brains of females. And some scientists took this as an explanation to why men are smarter than women and why there are fewer women than men at the universities there. Oh, okay, this is not this one. Okay. Today, when uh, women outnumber men at all levels of academic studies, uh, clearly this is not the problem, and still women have smaller brains than the brains of men. So this biological fact, the size of the brain, cannot explain why women are more than men now in the universities and very, very few at the end of the 19th century. So this is the first problem. The second problem I want to raise is that although we, are, we live in a highly gendered world, that is, we live in a world in which many people believe that men and women are fundamentally different, men from Mars, women from Venus. Yet, psychology tells us, and I'm talking about thousands and thousands of experiments in psychology, that men and women are remarkably similar in almost everything psychologists can measure cognitive abilities, emotional abilities, personality characteristics. There are only a few domains in which there are consistent sex differences. And also in these domains, the sex differences are rather small. So on the left you see the size of the difference of most uh, differences found in psychology. So the, you can see there's an enormous overlap between the distributions of males and females. The figure on the middle shows you the sex difference on mental rotation, which is one of the most cited and known differences between males and women. So see the huge overlap between the distributions, although there is a sex difference. And on the left you can see a sex difference that is rarely found, and for example, the difference in attitude towards casual sex, this is the size of it. So this is the second problem I see with trying to explain gender with sex. The third problem <coughs> I want to mention is that if we look only on the, on the features or the variables in psychology that show a sex difference. So we, we take differences in behaviors, in attitudes, in interests, in cognitive abilities. We take all the, the things that do show a sex difference. And we look at them together, we find that there are no correlations between them. And you know this, each one of you has both a feminine feminine characteristics and masculine characteristics, with feminine characteristics being the things that are more common in females and masculine characteristics being the things that are more common in males. And I'll take, for example, my 10-year-old son. So 
he loves soccer, which is in Israel is the male sport. So this is definitely a masculine characteristic. Characteristic. He also loves small kids and especially babies. Definitely a feminine trait. He also likes to read and play the piano. Again, a feminine trait. But he will never refuse if you suggest that you know we go around outside, uh, play rough and tumble with his uh, brothers, etc. So a masculine characteristic. And recently. He is really happy with the new skills in embroidery. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm saying it right, so I brought you the picture. Um, okay, so he's really happy with this, so again, a feminine trait. Now, I can assure you that he is male, but is he a boy or a girl? And what about you? Are you male or female? Are you a man or a woman? So let's do this together. So I put here a list of the basic, not all of them, but the basic sex characteristics at the most basic levels. I, I guess you know all of this. And what I would like to do is all the people here that have everything that is on, is on the female list. So you have ovaries, at least you were born with, because with medical, modern medical, maybe it has been taken out, okay? But you were born with ovaries, womb, clitoris, labia, okay? And this is not less important. You have nothing from the male list. So if you like have a womb and a penis, no good. Don't raise your hand, OK? So there are people like this. Don't laugh, OK? So all the people that have everything on the female list and nothing on the male list, please raise your hands. OK, so many females in the crowd. Now we'll do the same for males. So all the people that have everything that is on the male list but nothing from the female list, please raise your hands. So there are also males here. Now, if I ask all the females to move to this direction and all the males to move to that direction, there may be a few people left sitting. And this may be either because they have an intermediate form, like an ovotestis, for example, or because they have features from both the male list and the female list. And we classify these subjects as intersex. OK, so this is an important term. And it is estimated that about 1% of the population are intersex, and the rest are males or females, like most people here. Now let's do the same with gender. So I put here, I mean, there are many differences, so I put here the largest differences I could find. So I'll go through this quickly with you. Gender identity, so I, do you feel like a man? Do you feel like a woman? In a recent study, we have done about 30% feel the same as both, both a man and a woman. Sexual attraction to men, sexual attraction to women, about half of the population are attracted to both sexes. So you can start to appreciate the overlap, okay, but still, you know, there's a large sex difference here. Occupational preference is your occupation people oriented or things oriented. And so, for example, if you're a medical doctor, this is people oriented, but if you also do research, this is science oriented. And indeed, these are two orthogonal dimensions. So you can be high in both or low in both. Uh, emphasizing, systemizing, again, it shows a sex difference. So emphasizers, as it's written, wants to identify mental states and respond with appropriate emotion uh, versus a systemizer that wants to analyze systems and construct systems. And again, these are orthodontal dimension. You can be high in both. And the last two I took from Luan's book. So Luan, if you want to reframe, so please do. So women avoids conflicts and strides for harmony, and men will do everything to be at the top. And the last one, the most important for a woman, will be relations with others, and for men, sex, power, and status. So we'll do the same now, so all, but look at this carefully. So all the people in the crowd that have everything listed on the women list, everything, and nothing from the men list, please raise your hands. Okay, I see it's three women in the crowd. Good, this is more than I usually get. And let's now do it for men. All the people in the crowd that have everything on the men list and nothing from the women list, please raise your hands. No men here. So we see, so we see that when we divided this room into males and females, almost everyone was either at the male side or the female side, and we had really few intersex people. But when we try to divide this room into men and women, we are, most of us stay sitting in the middle. And this is what, what I called that we all have intersex gender. So if we apply the same criteria of male, female, intersex, then all of us have intersex gender. And this is what psychology shows us, that there are no correlations between the different variables. So each one of us is a unique mixture of male and female characteristics. So 
this, is the, this was the last problem uh, of this general question. So are there male brains and female brains? Can we explain gender with sex? My answer is definitely not, because there is a huge overlap, and also because there are not, not actually men and women. So you are meeting all the time males and females, but you never met a man and a woman. I mean, this was the first time for me to actually meet women, so I'm really happy about this, but usually I never meet women and men, only males and females. Thank you. Uh, like we wanted to talk with each other for a few minutes about some of the issues about male female and you know we can take it anywhere that any of you want from this point on and have a dialogue with the audience so having written a book called the female brain and one the male brain it makes it look like i think there's that side of the room and this side of the room but i, th I think if, if we bring remember all behavior comes from the brain so if we take it back to the biology of the brain and what our human brains do particularly well, I mean, each individual has, there's nobody in this room that has a brain like anybody else in this room. And there's more individual differences between two females than there is between a male and a female. So the overlap is absolutely huge. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that one of the things to know about, from the, t from the moment that you're born, there, it's all of this, so what, what, what sex you're identified as having, the moment you emerge from the womb, or the moment that you have your ultrasound and you see the penis and you know it's going to be a male, or you see the lack of one and you know it's going to be a girl, all of a sudden everybody starts projecting things onto to you or to the baby as an individual. So you really have this um, dialectic, this co-created reality that's, that's who you are based on your genitals. And um, based, so based on your sex, you start getting all kinds of projections about who you are as an individual, who you are in terms of your gender identity. If you're one, part of the 1% that does not feel that they're the gender that's been assigned to them, then you know, that's, a, that's a whole area, especially in San Francisco. We have lots of uh, clinics that, where we help uh, people transition one direction or the other. But I think the most important thing is that our brain circuits are, for humans are so wired for absorbing, osmosing the social environment. I mean, what we do to survive is to understand um, who we are as an individual based on what people are asking us to, telling us that we can do. Um, the gender differences in play environment for children that anybody in this audience work with Eleanor Maccabee, who was at Stanford for 30 or 40 years and did many of the um, observational studies in three and four year olds in the preschool setting here at Stanford. And um, remember, by the time a three year old gets to preschool, he or she has had a huge amount projected onto her and she's absorbed or he's absorbed a lot of what's expected and what's not accepted. So if you're one of the one out of 10 girls who tends to be more active and more rough and tumble play than a boy, than, than your average girl, then you're considered to have more masculine traits. But each individual is, is so unique in terms of, you're gonna hear it for the whole afternoon, the genetics, the receptorology, the, the uh, connectome in the brain is hugely individual. And we, one of our characteristics as an individual is our gender identity. So I, I tend to agree with all of what you had to say. And I think that one of the things that's very interesting nowadays is that, um, I noticed one thing you had up on, put, put the slide back up that had, I um, thought that was really interesting. You know, if you look at that and you say, you know, sex, power, status, you guys are living in Silicon Valley and so there's, there's I guess, one, one of the, the things that is highly valued is um, women in companies that sort of assume their power and are able to um, basically do more of what's on the bottom of the male chart is have power and status be something that's more important to her. And because our society now values that here in Silicon Valley, for example, one would predict that the next generation of girls that these parents here in Silicon Valley are, are raising are, are going to be much, maybe more interested in status and power and, and being uh, taking their skills in mathematics and engineering to the max. I know. Um, uh, so new here is our assistant, right? Both of your daughters are quite gifted mathematically, right? You know, and, and um, you know, I think that it's interesting that one of your daughters had the option of going to either Caltech or MIT, and she didn't want to go either of those places. She wanted to apply to like Stanford and Berkeley because she wanted to not be 
pigeonholed so early. So the types of choices that, that she makes, even though she's quite gifted and can go the engineering route, she wants to have more options than maybe she would. So the choices that we make are based on who we are as an individual, but so contextual in terms of our culture. Um, and I know I was talking with Carol last night, the, our anthropologist friend here, about how so much of our human brain by the time we get to be 20 years old is built and connected out of our, our cultural context. So I think that the issue of is there a male brain, a female brain, I think it's, when I work, so I, I work in a clinic, I started a clinic 20 years ago called the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, and I specialize in the aspects of, um, of mood, anxiety, that have to do often with either the menstrual cycle, so um, bad PMS would be an example of the kind of thing I treat, or um, having a, um, a postpartum depression, or in the perimenopause, having um, a decrease in your libido, your sexuality, increase in your irritability, and your mood. So I specialize in that area in psychiatry that has to do with the big gender differences in two to one ratio of depression in female over male. Um, I know later today there are gonna be some talks on autism and depending on who you talk to and how you define autism or Asperger's syndrome, it's an eight to one, even sometimes a 16 to one ratio, male uh, to female, for reasons that we don't understand. And I know Baron Cohen in, um, in England has the systematizing male brain extreme is, is autism or Asperger's. I, 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 my opinion is that's ridiculous. I, mean, I don't believe that, that that's what's going on with autism. I think autism is a neurological, neurodevelopmental disorder that we will eventually discover aspects of what goes wrong and why, in particular, males are more vulnerable to that illness. And why after the age of onset of menses at 12 to 15 years old, before that time, depression is one to one male to female. After that time, uh, it becomes the two to one females having more depression and anxiety than the male during the fertile years of her life. And then I tell my young female patients who have bad PMS, the good news is menopause is coming and you won't have the ups and downs. And the one-to-one -one ratio of depression that's true for male females in childhood returns closer to that one-to-one -one after menopause. So um, there are lots of human illnesses. Um, there, you know, Alzheimer's is, tends to be more in female. Um, Parkinson's disease is a little bit more in male. Schizophrenia is about a 1.4 ratio to one ratio with male predominance. So why do these diseases have differences? And some of you in the audience may have read, I guess, um, back in January, the very first time ever that the FDA kind of clawed back on the um, on the drug called Ambien. Anybody ever hear of Ambien? It's a sleeping medicine. A lot of us use it for jet lag and things, or for whatever night. Um, they release the dosages in too high a dosage, they believe, for females. So many of us who know that in animal research, it's about a five or six to one ratio of male animals that are studied. Females are not studied in early uh, studies, early trials of drugs, which is, too bad since once they get FDA approved, boom, you know, they're, they're written for all of us females and it's not dosage adjusted for us, it's not metabolic adjusted for us. So there's all kinds, the Institute of Medicine in this country in 2003 and 2009, 10, have had um, big convocations and published books trying to encourage the field, and scientists in all fields, but particularly neuroscience, to try and understand more about illnesses as they are um, applicable more to female and male. So that's part of what this conference is, is starting to look at. Um, and scientists are just now starting off down that path. So I think we're behind in that area. So how you think about the basic and the translational and how you think about in 15 years where medical um, science is gonna be in terms of how to look at a disease if it happens in a female body versus a male body. Some people in the kidney transplant world, for, now, for example, are trying to put male kidneys into males and female into female. So every cell in your body has XX if you are a female or XY if you're male. So every single cell is, has some, some 
sex to it, if you will. And what that means in certain diseases will be interesting to have that evolve. So that's my 30,000 foot view of, of our field that we're trying to kick off today. And I want to thank both uh, Lynn and Marcia for trying to do a wonderful job and uh, kick the ball down the road a little. Oh, yeah, I think you said, I have one. I think you said many things to some of which I agree. Uh, I think it's important to study sex, and there are important sex differences in psychopathology. Some are gender related, probably, and some may be sex related. But I also think that you clump together too many things. So I think the really surprising thing for me is that although the brain is so plastic, and although we are built to absorb gender that is put on us, even though there are so little differences between men and women. So can you just imagine how would the world look like and how would we look like if we didn't have gender put on us? Because even when it is, and I agree with you, from the moment we are born and even before that, we have everyone's expectation from us as being girls or boys. And even though we live with these expectations, see, you see this great overlap between men and women, and you see this great mixing between men and women. So there is no case to, to keep talking about uh, male, men and women the way we do as fundamentally different. And in our language, we all the time we keep uh, reinforcing this stereotype. So you see a, a girl that is active, and by the way, the difference in activity between boys and girls is 0.2 at the first year of, of life, which is what I showed you in the beginning. This is really, really small. You wouldn't see it on your kid, right? 0.2, Can't you, can you see who is more active? But we see a baby and it's active, and what do we say? She's act active like a boy. So we are reinforcing, she's not active like a boy, she's active exactly like a girl. So. But we are reinforcing that sh not, girls are not active and boys are active. So even if we see an active girl, we reinforce the views that boys are active and girls are not. And we do this all the time. So I think we should fight the stereotypes, not uh, write books no, that reinforce the, the stereotypes. And I think to present gender as a direct result of sex, to think that men strive for power and status, etc., not because there are men, so they are expected to do this, but because they have a high testosterone level, I think this is problematic. And I think there is no good evidence for this. So this is why I think we need to put together, uh, to put so clear so where we do not question. agree. What do you think the 10 to 1 ratio of testosterone level in males versus females is doing? I mean, what, what would you do with that? Would you decrease males' testosterone or increase Why should females, I decrease or? male testosterone? What's wrong with male testosterone? I don't see any problems with male testosterone. I also don't see any problem with the fact that females have a smaller brain. I do just fine and I really have a small brain. So I don't think it's about the differences. This is what I'm, I keep saying. Although there are biological differences, males are males and females are females and there are differences. We saw, right, we could divide the room to females and males, but we couldn't divide the room into active and non-active, good special abilities, bad special ability, good emotional abilities, bad emotional ability. You cannot divide this room. I mean, you can. So if we say all the active people go here and all the not active people go there, don't go there to find the good drivers because they will be here and here. This is the meaning of no correlation. So we can divide this room into males and females and we have all the people that need a, an explanation about prostate, they will be here. And all the people that need an explanation about you know, men, menstruation and stuff like this, they will be here. But you cannot divide the room in any meaningful way into all the people that have good special abilities, bad verbal abilities, uh, bad emotional uh, cognition. You cannot do this. Whichever division you will choose, you'll have both types. And then there is a great movement in, in the United States of single sex education because people believe there are male brains and female brains. There is a book, Boys and Girls Learn Differently. And I think this is like, it, it's terrible. This is the only thing I can say. And what this, writing this book or dividing classes into single sex assumes that if you put all the males here, you have all the kids that are very good in special abilities and mathematical abilities, although now this sex difference have flipped, right? It was true in the 70s, it's not, no longer true. Uh, so they need extra verbal uh, abilities and uh, they need to be very active and they have good special navigation skills. And you have here all the kids that can sit down quietly and will have good verbal abilities. But this is not true. 
So you can divide, you think that uh, some people need more activity and some need less activity, great, so divide the room to those that need a lot of activity and those that need little activity. Now, I want to say something. Uh, can I just see the slide so I can go to a slide that I want? Can you just take me off the presentation? So I, I want to say something about the gap between scientific evidence. And scientific evidence tells us that men and women are remarkably similar in almost everything psychologists can measure. So this is science. But we believe that men and women are remarkably, just take me off. I just want she to be off a, the screen. She wants to see. No, 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 I don't oh, want to be. OK. I think she wants to see that's okay. her whole no, no, presentation. Yeah. Right on this. So I just, I mean, I, I agree. I, I'm, I am definitely not in favor, in general, in, in, in taking single sex schools for everybody, I think that's, that ends up having girls and boys who learn differently. It, I think you should have only the very best teachers for every child rather than dividing them up into single sex schools. But I think, I, I agree with what you're saying about the schools and the way kids learn and not dividing them up into male and female brains for learning and et cetera, et cetera. I think that when, because I see, I, I look, I fast forward one's life to the experience of motherhood and taking care of the the kid and who stays home with the children but what about and who does that sex part couples? of things in but our culture. what about culture, single sex couples? Then you have two males or two females and right. they do everything. So we, have, we do have a lot of that. But I'm just thinking that our, our society has still got things that are divided up along the gender lines. I agree that we have a lines, problem with our just, society. I just don't, yes. don't think it's a matter of gender and uh, of sex and biology. So we agree. Yes, we I need agree to change that. our yep. society. No problem with the sex. You don't need to lower your testosterone levels. The females are still going to have the babies and the males are still going to inseminate, right? That's, they're still going to do those activities. Yeah, that's and, biology. Right, so that's biology. So at any rate, we have agreement on basic things, except I think that once you get to be in the range of having babies and trying to have a career and trying to juggle all of those things, you end up having a lot of social things that um, have to do with which gender you are. I agree, with, uh, we, see, we need to change this. Uh, I want to show you something about how can we explain the gap, because I think it's really an important question of how come science tells us there are no differences, even though we live in a gender society. And when we look around, we actually see men and women, and we feel that they are highly similar. And I'll just give you two ideas about this, because you know, there are many ideas about it. And so the first is that in psychology, we measure abilities and qualities. Whether when we look around, we have to estimate people according to what we see. So if you have to decide how intelligent I am, you cannot give me an IQ test. I mean, you can, but I wouldn't do it, right? So you have to estimate it by the way I behave here. So imagine that instead of meeting me here for the first time, you met me there. See me in the pink in the middle? So these are, these are my three sons. Uh, and probably if you saw me there for the first time, you thought that I would be less intelligent, but more, maybe more nicer and warmer than you think I am now. Now, <laughs> um, now clearly my abilities and qualities have not changed. What have changed is the situation. So in different situations, we behave differently. Other things that affect our behavior are stat is status, for example. So when I'm in high status, I behave differently when, when I'm in low status. And if you just want to test yourself, so just think of the way you respond to an, e student from an, e an email from a student to how you write an email to the president of your university. Okay? So the, your status, not your sex, your status affects the way you behave. You behave in a male-like style when you are in high status. And you behave in a female-like style when you are in low status. And expectations, and there is a lot about stereotypic threat and things like this, so expectations affect that a lot. And you can see that all the things written down in the brackets are all different for males and females because of the gender division. So you'll see, you are more likely to see females with kids than you are likely to see males with kids. And similarly, you are more likely to see men in high status than women in high status, etc. So the behavior we are watching of the people around us is more different than their actual abilities and qualities because we live in a gendered world, okay? So this is the first thing. The second thing I want to say is that when we look at the men and women around us, we are biased, so we are not neutral or naive observers. We have our own schemas of what we expect from 
men and women, from males and females. And this schema, schema is a psychological word for all the ideas and associations you have about a subject. So these schemas affect perceptions, uh, and there is a lot of studies in social psychology about this. And I just want to, to have uh, you, uh, to give you the feeling of how, how a large effect in a schema can have. So this is a visual perception bias. And you can see the two squares, a dark square, two squares with a, a circle, the yellow circle. Can you all see that the upper square is darker than the bottom square? Would you believe me if I told you that they are exactly the same? Yeah, you believe me? I wouldn't believe me. Okay, <laughs> you are very trusting. Okay, but I can show you that they are exactly the same. Can you see now that they are exactly the same? Okay, now hold this knowledge that they are exactly the same. Did it help? Okay, so this is perception bias. Our brain, because of the different cues that there are there, interprets the picture on the retina as two different colors or two different brightness, although it's actually the exact same brightness. And even though we now know that it's the exact same brightness, we still perceive it to be different. Now, really recently, there have been a study in the States, and the researchers sent scientists application forms of students. And the application forms were exactly identical. It had only one difference, whether the applicant name was a male or a female. And this is what they found. So these are different measures of competence, uh, how much you would like to hire this guy, how much uh, will you uh, be ready to mentor this guy, okay? And you can see, uh, if you didn't know, so the dark one is um, for the male name and the light one are for the female name. So you see a difference. It's the exact same application, just whether they thought it was coming from a male or from a female. And what I want to say is that this is exactly the same. So we have our gender schema. And when we have our gender schema, even though the input is exactly the same, we see men and women differently. So if you put the two together, that even if you take two exact same person in terms of qualities, abilities, etc., if one is male and one is female, they will behave differently because of the situation, the status, and the expectation. And then on top of this, you add that we will not view them the same, even if they were exactly the same. Then you can start to explain the big gap between scientific evidence that men and women are remarkably similar and our feeling that there are you know, women from Mars, men from uh, Venus or the other way around, I can uh, never remember. So, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm looking at that, this is very interesting to me because I'm thinking, you know, when I first learned there's a two to one ratio of depression in females over males, especially in the fertile years, it's when you're growing up. Um, my, I grew up, I was at uh, UC Berkeley in the feminist era in the early 70s and so I just thought, of course, women are more depressed. They have the oppressive patriarchy over them. Everything is scheduled and, you know, in, in the world, rigged outside the home for males. But this, but this, uh, I want this graph that you show here of the, you know, so this is, it's not quite two to one, but there's, there's definitely, if women have to, if, if, there, if we women are always paddling, paddling upstream, you know, to try and prove ourselves and have to be twice as good, or like that P level, that P level of 0.001 is rather remarkable in that, in this study that you show. So, so there, there may be much more than we're thinking about just the biology of depression in females. There's also paddling upstream hard in one's life and in one's career and trying to be superwoman and doing it all. So that's, that's something that's um, got to do. I mean, certainly the, the female brain has a lot more on its plate trying to do there both career no and raising, raising kids at any rate. So did you want to open it up to the audience a little bit at some point? Um, did, is there someone, we have an extra microphone where someone would like to have something to say. I'll just walk around with it because it's easier that way. Here you go. This is a question, this is a question for Dr. Joel. Um, closely overlapping bell-shaped curves often contain nonetheless huge differences at the tails. And I think some of the apparent debate here boils down to a difference between looking at the center of the curve and the tails. Do you, for example, believe that the gigantic differences in rates of violent crime committed by women versus men across virtually all human cultures that I'm aware of, even including Israel, I believe, where women are trained for combat and routinely serve in the army, are entirely the result of projections of stereotypical gender differences as opposed to something uh, 
intrinsic to the bodies of men and women? Okay, I have two things to say about this. First, I want to say something about the new myth because, you know, the myth of the sex difference is never vanishing, it's only changing. So it used to be for many years that the average, difference in average was explaining the differences between men and women, but now it's not working anymore because there are hardly any differences in averages. So there's a new myth and the new myth, and you know, Harvard uh, president lost his job, I wouldn't want to lose my job for this, but uh, so the new myth is that the variance is greater for males, so this is why you have more geniuses and more morons. Okay, in males, this is a new, they, they wouldn't mind having some more morons if you let them have more geniuses for biological reasons. So this is a new myth. So first, I just want to, you know, to frame it, and there is already, I mean, it's a new myth, so we don't have a lot of evidence about it, but there is already evidence that the differences in variants, when, where they exist, they can be different in different cultures, etc., etc. So it's just a new version, and when this goes by, then another one will come. Because this myth preserves patriarchy. So this myth preserves male hegemony. And to have hegemony of whichever kind, you need to exert both violence, and we see it all over the world now, that when hegemony is a hegemony, how do you say it? Yeah, when, it, when it's, um, people go against it, then you use a lot of violence. But it also works through the discourse. So if you uh, make people believe that things are exactly how they should be, then people don't come up and fight against it. So about violence, I see that I agree that there are, is more male violence in patriarchal societies. And this is a direct consequence of patriarchy, because patriarchy is about males having more power, both in terms of money, but also in terms of weapons and everything else. Now, if you are the group that exerts more power, you're also more likely to get hurt by this power. And I want just to give you an example from uh, our recent uh, elections in Israel. And we had three parties that had women on top, which is very seldom even in Israel. And um, well, we are actually not so good at the uh, gender bias. And uh, there was, you know, people were talking about that they should join forces and run together. But they couldn't decide who would be the top one. And you would, you know, you would say, you oh, women, yeah, they just let them run the world. They will do perfect job because women, they just care about harmony and everything. They don't care about sex, status, and power, right? But when a woman is in power, she becomes like everyone else that has power. So the difference we see is between people that have power and people that don't have power. And when a woman, a female, has power, then she behaves like everyone else that has power. And they couldn't decide, and they lost the elections. Okay, so to Netanyahu, a male that has a lot of power. So. I, so this is to, to your question, and there is an anthropologist sitting just in front of you, and I don't know the statistics, there are only very few societies today that don't have male domination, and I don't know the statistics there, but in history, it is assumed that there were more societies with equality, uh, and that there was much less violence, both of men, between men and women, and between men and women, and this is what I know, but of course, today it's really difficult to answer this question. Carol, would you like to say something? <clears throat> we have an assumption that history and humanity started with what we would call stratified large state societies. And so we consider a really ancient society, maybe Hindu civilization or Egyptian or whatever, 10,000 years ago. Whereas 99% of human history has been foraging people, which is not predominantly hunting, it's predominantly gathering and fishing, which doesn't have quite the cachet. Fisher, you know, man the fisherman, um, <laughs> as the hunting. And I think one of the, so, so and, and if we look at, I mean, violence, you start getting <coughs> the image of violent societies with some horticultural groups, partially over land, uh, scarcity of land. And it's ironic because I've been reading up on recent primatology in Uganda, um, and there are tremendous differences uh, among different chimpanzee groups in the amount of violence. And there's the same thematic resurgence of the emphasis on the few cases of infanticide, mainly from Tanzania and Gombe and Mahale, which are two other regions, and the emphasis, re-emphasis on male dominance, even though the Uganda data doesn't support it, but they can find the one case of infanticide. And again, the one case of meat-eating 
So we're finding this backlash and this resurgence of these old simplistic models which are biologically rooted and they're still there for race, which is another area that I work on and I would suggest the American Anthropological Association's huge four and a half million dollar public museum exhibit called Race, Are We So Different? Rather than How Different We Are. Um, the same resurgence of biological explanations uh, because they're so simple. They're so embedded in this culture. And I do want to make a comment about the women in math in, in India because I did a research project on women's career choices in India. And of course, the math problem with women has been part of the gender ideology in this country for a long time. And one of the first things that I found in India is that girls um, do well in math. Uh, and at least at that time, although the spread of culture is enormous in terms of beliefs, it was laughable to think that girls didn't go into engineering because they couldn't do math. That was funny. That was weird. That was odd because everybody did know that women did very well in math. And rather, it was social contextual factors, including the male-dominated workplaces and fears of what it would look like for a young unmarried female to be in that context, plus differential resources giving given to males and females, to boys and girls by families, given the residential patrifocal. So these have to do with culture. And so I think we, policy-wise, it's really important to think of what are the differences policy-wise for solving the problem, let's say, of violence um, or whatever issues the policy implications of focusing on minute biological differences, whether it's race or whether it's gender, um, versus the kind of social contextual things that are producing these behaviors. Thanks very much, Carol. I was thinking that I've had the opportunity to speak to lots of leaders in the world, mostly groups of males in cultures, and I say, you know, okay, I get them to first agree that the IQs of male and female brains, the IQs of male and female brains are basically the same, there's no difference. And I say to, to, to the men, male tribal leaders, you know, if you want to move your culture ahead, you cannot leave out half of the highest IQ brains in your society. I, you must educate your girls. So that's a kind of a way to use the biology to, and, and, and they get that right away. So cultures that don't support their girls, that don't support extra resources in families or the culture to have girls that are um, highly talented to move on. And that's, that's something that I think policy-wise we can get, get behind pretty easily. I wanted to say something about uh, uh, sex and the effects of uh, especially hormones on, on the brain, because I don't want uh, the impression that what I'm saying is that there is no sex. What I'm saying is that there is sex, but there shouldn't be gender. It's not the same. And I want to say something about why there aren't male brains and female brains, not just because there is nothing to explain, which is what I was doing up until now, telling you that men and women are remarkably similar, but because actually there are sex differences in the brain that just don't add to create a male brain and a female brain. So I want to just show you a few uh, things about this. And uh, many people think about the brain, this is the genitalia, it's not the brain yet. So many th uh, people think about the brain and the effect of testosterone on the brain as what we know about the genitalia. And what we know is that uh, a B, um, B potential genitalia in the fetus develops into a male genitalia under high levels of testosterone and or into a female genitalia after, uh, under low levels of testosterone. And many people have taken this view and put it on the brain and believe that that the same is happening in the brain. So the brain is a big potential entity, and then under high levels of testosterone, we will have a male brain, and under a low level of testosterone, we will have a female brain. Now, this would have been true if testosterone was the only factor responsible for the sexual differentiation of the brain, and if it was the, uh, acting via a single mechanism. And if these two things were true, then indeed we will have a bipotential brain that under high levels of testosterone 
everything is turning into the male form. And if you don't have, or you have only low levels of testosterone, it will be the female form. However, as it turns out, these two assumptions are not correct. So although testosterone has a role in sexual differentiation of the brain, estradiol has an important role in the feminization of the brain, which are two independent processes. And Peg McCarthy has done a lot of work about this. And both testosterone and estradiol are acting via many different mechanisms. So they are not doing the same all over the brain. And what these researchers, and what Arnold, who is sitting here, has uh, argued is that sexual differentiation may progress independently in different brain regions. So it's not that the whole brain is turning male or turning female. And indeed, there is a lot of data showing, this is what I started with, there is a lot of data showing that environmental events can change the sex of some brain regions. And I just want to show you just one example. And what you see here is a dendrite, a piece of dendrite from a male rat. This is above and from a female rat. It's from a region of the hippocampus. And I added red arrows so you can better see the spine. So the spine are the small circles, circuits that you see along the dendrite. And you can clearly see a sex difference. So for me, for example, it was the first time I actually saw a sex difference in the brain, probably also for you. And I want to thank Tracy Shores for sending me these remarkable pictures. And you see a sex difference. So we can say that there is a male form, a low density of spines, and a female form, which is high density of spines. Now, there was another group of rats in this study, and they underwent 15 minutes of stress, just like park, looking for a parking place, OK? <laughs> and look at their dendrites. So this is a dendrite from a stressed male. It looks exactly as a dendrite from a non-stressed female. And the dendrite from the stressed female looks exactly like the dendrite from the stressed male. So we see that a very simple manipulation, such as 15 minutes of stress, can completely reverse what is male and what is female in the brain. Now, if you go back to the genitalia, imagine that every time that you were looking for parking, you were going out of the car and saying, oops, my breasts are gone again. <laughs> have another question? Mm. Go ahead. Just a second. Now, it's not that the entire brain is changing. So it's not that the entire brain is flipping from the male form to the female form or backwards. And this is another study uh, from Margaret McCarthy's group, actually. And what you can see here is what we've seen before. So in males, they are changing after this is after chronic stress. They are changing from the male form, which is high density of receptors in this example, to the female form, which is low density of receptors. And in females, the opposite is happening. So again, we see a switch. Chronic stress, again, you see a switch. The males have now the female form, the females have the male form. But in another region of the hippocampus, the ventral hippocampus, you see something different. So in males, again, they have the female form, but in females, nothing has changed. So if we assume that females had a female brain or a female hippocampus before stress, then look what happens after stress. Part of the hippocampus became male, but part of the hippocampus remained female. So actually, even if they had a female, hippocampus before the, the stress, then now they have an intersex hippocampus, right? They both have a male and a female features of the hippocampus. And if you look at the males and assume that they had a male hippocampus before the stress, then following stress, they now have a female hippocampus. But it's not just the entire brain is changing, so some regions of their brain remained male. So they're also having an intersex hippocampus. So this is what I'm saying, that there are no male brains and female brains, because each one of us his brain is, or her brain is always changing. So even if we assume that at some point the entire brain was female, then after these events, stress, different housing conditions, anesthesia even, so many, many different uh, events that can take place throughout our lives and also uh, in utero, uh, then following such events, we will have both male and female characteristics. So we will have intersex brains. And, and I will talk about this later today. Actually, there are not just two forms to each of these regions. They can make many forms. And just to give you an example, think about height. So height definitely shows a sex difference. But we do not talk about a male height and a female height, right? Height comes in many categories, if you want. Some people are short, some are very short, some are tall, some are very tall, some are basketball players, right? Height can be very different. It was supposed to be funny. Never mind. <laughs> So it's the same with the brain. The fact that sex affects the brain, the fact that there are sex differences in the brain, doesn't mean that brain features come in only one of two forms. They are more like height, like 
like, uh, than like genitalia or like ovary and, and testes. So brain features come in many forms and their form can be changed differently uh, by environmental conditions and it may depend on sex. So some brain features will change their form similarly in males and females and some will change it differently. And as a result, we all have a, a, a brain which is composed of many, many different regions, uh, each with a different form. And we cannot divide brains as we cannot, could not divide this room. We cannot divide brains into male brains and female brains in, in any meaningful meaning. The only thing we can say is that females have brains and males have brains. This we can say, okay? But we cannot divide the brains themselves. Brains do not have sex. Hi, right. I was wondering if you could expand on your opinion of single sex schools. Is it just you don't approve them? approve of them because you think they reinforce that there are differences? Because I like personally went to an all-girls high school and I thought it was a really good choice because it like got rid of um, any like social construct like pressures on differences. And I was just like wondering if you could explain your opinion more. There could be many reasons to have single-sex schools. It can be religious regions, right? Uh, there is a lot of um, controversy about having single-sex schools, especially for women. Uh, whether women do better because they are, you know, free of stereotypic threat, threat. So there is a lot of controversy about this. But I'm talking particularly now about single-sex schools that have an ideology that you need to separate the sexes because they are so different. Now, what I think is that you, we need safe environment for boys and girls. And we need to change again. We need to change the social system, right? So girls can study in a mixed school and don't feel pressure and, don't be her and, and are not harassed. But to put ourselves into prisons that should protect ourselves, this is not a solution. It just amplifies the problem, OK? Because then you just increase the gender gap because you treat all girls the same and all boys the same and you just increase these differences. So I agree there is a problem, a terrible problem in our society, which is male dominated with male violence against women and against other males. And this should be changed. But the right way to change this is not by separating us and putting usually women under uh, barriers. So they are protected. Okay? So I would, um, <laughs> um, I've heard a lot and, and um, have thought about a million things to say uh, um, uh, or not say. But number one, um, I would submit that, pardon? So my name's Art Arnold. I'm the last speaker. And, and um, uh, I just I'm mentioned fascinated by, by uh, what both of you have been talking about. But um, uh, number one, I would say that, in fact, there, there are male and female brains. OK, there, there are, I could point to a few genes that are probably expressed at a higher level in every one of your brain cells and aren't expressed in any of my brain cells, okay? Or at a much lower level, for example. And we don't know what those genes are doing to brain structure and function. But it makes us wonder if, if every cell in the female brain is expressing a gene and none of the cells in the male brain is, does that have an effect? And it's, po it's quite possible. Um, uh, I would never have just, I agree with you on the height analogy here, and we don't say there's a male height and the female height, and we don't say that the number of spines is a male, male spine number. But what I think is useful is to um, identify the controlling variables, okay? What, do, what are the male-specific variables, uh, forces, biological and social, what are the female biased or, or specific variables, and then to try to understand how they influence the different phenotypes. Here you have probably a combination of variables. So stress is one of them, and that we don't think of that as a sex-biased uh, uh, variable, but the different response of the males and females to the stress is sexually differentiated. And the question is, is that biology or society is a one big These question. Are right and in rats, you probably immediately jump to the biological explanations because we don't study rat societies very well. But, um, and they're a poor model for human societies, right? So it's not that we don't use them to model um, our understanding. Uh, so, um, you know, fundamentally it comes down 
to, to dissociating these variables and trying to understand them. And in humans, they're so hopelessly intertwined that I love to retreat to my mice where I don't have to uh, worry about this complexity but, um, and where we can study the biology a little bit more simply. But, but I don't, uh, anyway, so, um, uh, and it's not just that the exist gene is turned on in the female brain and it's not in the male brain and all over the male body and female body, but there are permanent effects of testosterone on the brain that are lasting in males and there are effects of estrogen, although it's a lot harder in females that are feminizing effects of estrogen. It's actually much easier to, in, a, in, in animal models to find masculinizing effects of estradiol as a metabolite of testosterone. And those are much more potent and have been known for 50 years as opposed to the, the feminizing effects of estrogen, which are small and hard to find and have only been known for a few years. So. Thanks, Art, for your comment. And I've been told that we have the hook here in terms of time because we're going to run into the next group. So on that happy note, the interesting speakers that are coming up in the next couple of hours are going to dive deep quickly and uh, in their area of science. And so by the end of the day, hopefully all of you who stay around will have a deeper understanding and have some opinions of your own on whether there is a male or whether there is a female brain or whether there is not. So I want to thank you all very much and thank Stafna for coming all the way from Israel to talk with us. And I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you all very much.